You're watching Tag TV. Uh, the study of consciousness uh, is one of the humankind's most fundamental quests. Uh, traditionally, consciousness has been a province of philosophical and theological explorations. And in the recent times, it has moved to the forefront of the 21st century scientific inquiry as well. Um, with that, I would like to invite uh, our moderators for this session today. Uh, first of all, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Subhash Khan. Uh, he obviously needs no introduction, but you know, I would like to uh, still say a few words. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Subhash Khan is a uh, Padmushari and has worked in the computer science, artificial intelligence, quantum information, and history of science, and has translated several texts from mm -hmm. Sanskrit. Um, he currently also serves on the Indian Prime Minister's Science, Technology, Innovation and Advisory Council and will be leading uh, the moderation of this session. Uh, with that, I would also like to invite uh, Dr. Anand Venkat uh, and uh, he is uh, in the field of uh, neurosciences and is currently practicing and is based out of the uh, University of South Carolina. So, with that, uh, I would like to... Uh, Invite Mr. Anand Venkatraman, please. Thank you. Uh, namaskar. Welcome everybody to the special session on the science of consciousness. Thank you very much, Ankur, for that introduction. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce everybody else we have on stage here today. Uh, first, on my right, Dr. Rudy Tanzi. Dr. Tanzi is a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. He is co-director of the McCann's Center for Brain Health at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Tanzi discovered several Alzheimer's disease genes, including all three early onset familial Alzheimer's genes. He is the director of the Alzheimer's Genome Project. He's developing therapies for treating and preventing Alzheimer's disease using human mini brain organoid models. These were pioneered in his laboratory. He's also introduced recently the antimicrobial hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease, implicating infection in the disease process. He's published 600 papers, received the Metropolitan Life Award, Potemkin Prize, Smithsonian American Ingenuity Award, and he was on the 2015 Time 100 Most Influential People in the World list. He's a New York Times best-selling author, who has co-authored uh, Decoding Darkness and three bestsellers with Deepak Chopra, Super Brain, Super Genes, and The Healing Self. So welcome, Dr. Tanzi. <laughs> and uh, continuing with our stellar list, uh, over to the right of Subhashji is uh, Professor Menas Kafatos. Dr. Kafatos is the Fletcher Jones Endowed Professor of Computational Physics at Chapman University. He is the Director of the Center of Excellence in Earth Systems Modeling and Observations. He is a quantum physicist, a cosmologist, and a climate science researcher. He works extensively on science issues, quantum mechanics, cosmology, consciousness, and philosophy. He holds seminars and workshops for individuals, groups, corporations, on the natural laws that apply everywhere and are the foundations of the universe for well-being and success. He is a foreign member of the Romanian Academy, and he was elected a foreign member of the Korean Academy of Science and Technology, clearly indicating his extraordinarily global reach. He also leads extensive international collaborations with universities and research centers in different countries, including Greece, Italy, Japan, and Korea. He's authored 330 articles. He's the author or editor of 20 books, including The Conscious Universe, Looking In, Seeing Out, Living the Living Presence, and uh, in Korean, Science, Reality, and Everyday Life. He's also a co-author with Deepak Chopra of the New York Times bestseller, You Are the Universe. So welcome, Dr. Kafato. <laughs> and finally, at the right corner of the table, uh, Dr. Vinod Deshmukh, MD, PhD. He is an Emeritus Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Florida. He's published over 60 scientific articles, including a monograph on brain blood flow. His recently published articles were on topics such as the neuroscience of meditation, multi-stream self, Turiya, Prana Dhyana, Vedic psychology as a science of wisdom, 
the cognitive pause and unload, the CPU hypothesis of meditation and creativity. His latest book is called The Astonishing Brain and Holistic Consciousness, Neuroscience and Vedanta Perspectives. He also has very interesting hobbies, poetry, photography, oil paintings. He's published six books of poetry, essays, photographs, and he was also awarded the Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Award by the Marquis Who's Who Publications in 2018. So welcome, Dr. Desha. So now that everybody is up here and introduced, so welcome again to this special session, everyone. Um, this is a very unique session because it's poised at the interface between lots of different fields. As you can see here, physics and neuroscience for sure, medicine as well, Eastern thought, primarily Hindu, as well as Western science and ancient Western philosophy. As Hindus, I think all of us are aware that it's very important for us to bridge the gap or the bridge the divide between Western-derived scientific modernity and Hindu thought. First of all, as Hindus, right from the time of the Rig Veda, it is said, let good thoughts come to us from all directions. So I think it is very ingrained in us that we like to have good ideas irrespective of the source. So Western scientific modernity has produced wonderful miracles. It's uh, produced amazing cures for wonderful diseases. I mean, for uh, wonderful cures for many diseases. And so it's clear that it works and it's worthy of learning and uh, emulating. At the same time, I think as Hindus, we also know that our traditions have a lot to offer because you know already there's inter interest all over the world in things like yoga, Ayurveda, meditation. And I think at some level, we do realize that there is a lot of depth in our civilizational history, which needs to be explored with new lenses. And I think that's why this session is so critical and timely. Now, whenever you're trying to blend two fields of such divergent backgrounds, the problem always stems from the fact that they start from radically different metaphysical assumptions. The primary metaphysical assumption underlying Western science is that there is an external objective reality and that is the most important thing that you can know of and that's what you should start from when you're starting to study the universe. In Hindus, importance is always given primarily to the internal reality, so consciousness within, and then from there you progress onwards outwards. So in neuroscience, which is one of the cutting edge, most uh, highly evolved fields of Western science, there is a fairly sizable number of experts who say everything outside is real. Consciousness is an epiphenomenon, which essentially means it is an illusion created by the functioning of the brain's networks. On the other hand, if you read Hindu texts, as you know, especially in things like Advaita Vedanta, they say consciousness is the only reality. The external world is the illusion. So as you can imagine, these are like 180 degree opposing views of the same reality. Oh, this is yours. That's yours. I was wondering what the You must have said Siri. <laughs> I might have. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> Ask Siri what's consciousness. <laughs> I don't want to even get started there. <laughs> okay. So, coming back. Um, as a modern scientist, I think most of us would imagine that the best people poised to study consciousness would be neuroscientists, neurologists, and you would be true. Like, when I went into neuroscience, I started noticing that much of it revolved around what consciousness was and like then disorders of consciousness and all that. But I also started realizing that what I was studying in my medical education seemed to have a lot of echoes in Indian thought. My personal interest started growing towards the field of Tantra and how it can be interpreted through the lens of neuroscience. But the truth is, in the 20th century, as most of you probably already know, the question of who should be studying consciousness underwent a huge shift. And this was due to discoveries in physics, primarily in the field known as quantum mechanics, because they started noticing that most of these experimental findings that they were having could only be explained in a sensible manner if there was a conscious observer. So now suddenly, physics, which was considered like the gold standard of Western objective science, which really studies the world out there, 
suddenly it was turning into this field for which consciousness was becoming the centerpiece. So this really potentially radically upends the metaphysical assumptions of uh, pre-quantum Western science. And I think that's why this panel with two physicists, computer scientists, and three neuroscientists is wonderfully poised to expound further on this uh, critical topic and also provide the Hindu perspective on this fundamental human question. So with that, I'll turn the uh, 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 position over to Subhashji. As uh, you guys know, he's a fantastic thinker, fantastic scientist, and inspiration to me and many others. And we would love to hear more from him. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. And greetings uh, to all of you uh, for this panel. This is really the big one, because uh, we all um, take the universe in, in our consciousness, but we don't know what it is. And uh, not only does it uh, perplex us uh, when we start to think about it, but it perplexes everybody else as well, especially now when uh, AI is in the air and people are wondering where AI machines would go. In fact, two years ago, uh, the science establishment in the US decided to get together a group of 20 to 30 people from different fields, such as neuroscience and physics and quantum mechanics and uh, philosophy. Uh, nine week-long workshops, uh, different cities in the US and in Cambridge, UK, to determine if machines of the future, not 20 years from now, maybe 50 years from now, would be conscious like us human beings. And if they could be conscious, clearly then we uh, stand at, a, at one of those dramatic moments in history, because if machines were to become conscious, they would really have no need for human beings, right? So what will happen to humanity is a question that comes up. In any event, uh, in Cambridge, uh, the 20 odd of us took a poll and half of us decided that indeed machines of the future will be conscious like us. And these, uh, these half and I was not one of them, uh, their logic was that look, uh, with more and more computing power, you would be able to emulate more and more of the brain function. And at a certain point, once the complexity of the emulation has crossed some point, uh, the machine will be conscious exactly like us. But the other half concluded that no, there is something more to consciousness than just emulation of the machine, which does not solve some fundamental problems, such as why is the brain machine conscious while the computer machine is not conscious? Those are more nuanced questions that we may have time to come to later on. But uh, so the other half said, no, machines will never become conscious. But everybody agreed that machines will be able to emulate almost all the cognitive functions that we perform, which means that machines will replace human beings more and more at more and more jobs. And therefore, whether machines are conscious or not, the humanity is entering a new phase of its history. Uh, a lot of people, maybe uh, there will be jobs in 100 years for only a billion people, not 10 billion people. So where humanity goes to that place from where it stands now poses challenges that we, nobody knows how to deal with. And in fact, my own view is that almost everybody in every country of the world is worried about these matters, and that's why uh, the politics that we see in the US and in Europe where people are voting for people who are saying that this system is broken, you don't know how to solve it. They are prepared to get a chance, give a chance to anybody who hopefully uh, would raise these questions and see where, what we should do. In any event, to come back to the topic here, uh, as Anand uh, pointed out, physicists at least the standard view of quantum mechanics, it's called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, does view consciousness as separate from material reality. And in fact, the founder of QM 
uh, an Austrian physicist named Erwin Schrodinger, claimed in his own autobiography that he was inspired by Vedanta, by the Upanishads. In fact, the Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahma, which says that this Atman uh, represents the entire cosmos, which is, of course, as far as ordinary logic is concerned, um, counterintuitive. But this is the very heart of Vedanta, and this is the very heart of reality with its counter-logical aspects. Um, and maybe that's why we have a physicist and neuroscientist at the same table uh, pushing at this problem from different angles. So with this uh, as the intro, what uh, we're going to do here is uh, have both uh, uh, Rudy and uh, Menas uh, have uh, some back and forth questions that I have here. And also Vinod will speak of his general perspective on this problem. So let me start with uh, Rudy first. Uh, and uh, we want it to be as personal as it can be. So I'm going to put some questions to you. And the first question is, uh, uh, as a neuroscientist, what are your thoughts about the metaphysics of consciousness? Ooh. <laughs> well, um, you know, I've been at Harvard my whole career from student to professor. And in the neuroscience department, we are taught that the brain is the organ that gives rise to consciousness. Um, and honestly, I have to ask, if we take the brain as something that's material and it's giving rise to consciousness, the first question you have to logically ask is, where did this material come from? How did it, how did it appear? Uh, and people hand wave and say, well, you know, <clears throat> it just came. And to me, that's not appropriate. You know, to me, I have to say that since I don't really buy into a material world, I think it's very tough to explain how we have a magical house called the universe with physical trinkets of different sizes floating around that are actually material, that it makes much more sense that all of this, all of what we experience <clears throat> is in consciousness. Um, and that includes the brain and the working of the brain. So the brain is actually a manifestation of consciousness itself. Um, I, I've often discussed with Deepak over the years, what is the difference between awareness and consciousness? And I think where we finally landed is that awareness is existence. You can't have existence without awareness of existence. And pure awareness is obviously independent of time and space. But what does awareness do? It, it becomes aware. What can it be aware of? It can be aware of itself. So when awareness becomes aware of awareness, now you create time and space. You can't be aware of something or have attention to something if there's not a place to do it and, and a time to do it. And so to me, consciousness is an output of pure existence, pure awareness, God, call it what you wish, that is now aware of itself, and we are the play. This is consciousness is awareness with attention. Even in the medical world, we say that consciousness is awareness with attention. And when, when awareness takes on attention to create consciousness, which we are all part of, this is where space and time now come into play. It's just that for different aspects of consciousness, there's different levels of information and different levels of complexity Thus, our universe is very different than a bacteria's. But it's all just a level of complexity and information within the consciousness you get to experience as awareness becomes aware of itself. A little bit esoteric answer for a neuroscientist at Harvard, but uh, this is what I uh, truly uh, believe at the most metaphysical level. OK, thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, uh, now, um, we will go back and forth many times. I wasn't expecting that question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Vedanta, because that's one of the uh, words associated with our panel, uh, Vedanta uh, tells us that uh, there are two kinds of knowledge, the lower and the higher, the apara and the para. And para is uh, the knowledge associated with the perceiving self, and apara is the knowledge of what we see materiality or concepts and relationship between concepts for which we use language. Now, one of the uh, uh, very popular forms of Vedanta is called Kashmir Shaivism. In Kashmir Shaivism, the whole idea is consciousness itself is Atman. In fact, the very first sutra of the Shiva Sutra is Chaitanyam Atma. Uh, 
Now, it so turns out that Menas has been studying and practicing Kashmir Shaivism for a long time. And I think you were here in Cambridge when you got into it many, many years ago. So, uh, uh, Menas, uh, what drove you towards Kashmir Shaivism and how is that related to your work as a physicist? Thank you, Subhash. Can you all hear me? So since we're going to ask some personal questions, I have one personal question. What, what makes, um, in the United States, uh, people turn on the air conditioning when it's cold outside? <laughs> I'm joking. I, I have no hair, so I, I was very sensitive on air conditioning. Um, but back to your question, uh, Kashmir Shaivism. Um, yes. What um, drove me, I have no idea, to be honest with you. And in fact, um, as uh, I grow older and older, or younger and younger, depending on uh, uh, what quantum point of view you follow, um, because in fact, in quantum physics, you can have time go the other way. Um, the, now I know, after the fact, I know that um, things seem to make sense, that Back then, I didn't even know what the world was. But I always had a sort of a desire to uh, know a little bit more about uh, what makes the universe uh, go. That's why, in a sense, I went into science. Um, actually, machines are definitely aware. <laughs> um, what actually drove me to a certain extent was um, um, the sky in Greece, I grew up in Greece, and looking at the Milky Way galaxy, and sort of wondering what, what are all these uh, little dots of light, which of course we know, we call them stars. And um, we have um, a big um, collection of stars called the Milky Way. Milky Way, of course, means uh, um, it's a band that looks uh, milky because it has so many uh, stars that you cannot distinguish them with the naked eye. And by the way, the stars that actually we can see with the naked eye are only about 3,000. So they, they look uh, uh, many, but they're a tiny portion of the true number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which is um, um, 100 billion stars. And there's about a trillion galaxies in the universe, and you can do the math, uh, how many uh, stars and then planets there are. But back to the point, um, if we uh, want to give a personal answer, and today I sort of come to the conclusion that um, everything is um, a subjective experience. And for a scientist, a, a physicist to say that, it, say, it sounds like a counter um, to what uh, physics would say. But in fact, uh, the uh, current state of um, uh, science belief uh, is fairly recent, actually. It's uh, really only in the last 300 years or so, primarily with the French Revolution. Um, in the West that it became um, a belief of an external universe. Throughout um, the Western history, not just um, uh, in the West, but also, of course, as we know in the East, but throughout the Western history, in fact, uh, throughout Western times, it was not that way. It was uh, philosophy that was uh, uh, believed to hold a way over um, what one would think of the universe. And um, perhaps the greatest scientist, Isaac Newton himself, um, was uh, a mystic and uh, followed uh, um, you know, ancient writings and tried to explain the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. People sort of say, well, that was not really, uh, that was not the true Newton. But of course, the true Newton is the, is the one that Newton knew, not, not what we think it was. Um, what, um, now, looking back, um, I say, well, really, um, we only know about the present. We only know the now, whatever you want to call it. Um, the past is something that's an experience. We put it together. It keeps, keeps back coming together, perhaps, the same way. So then we say, well, it uh, means that there's time. So there's a, a narrow time. Um, but in fact, all we know is what is happening to us, and we can call it now. 
whether you call it now or the future or the past, it doesn't really matter. It's all an experience. And if you try to prove something outside, then of course that itself is an experience. Mathematics is an experience. Um, we experience experience. Um, Rudy just um, mentioned um, the difference between uh, awareness and consciousness. Um, in the West, we maybe have two words, awareness and consciousness. Of course, in Sanskrit, we have uh, many words, um, chitti, um, shakti, uh, chit, um, ananda, etc. for the feminine aspect to which we associate with consciousness. Um, and of course, we have um, several names for, for the uh, inert side of things, so to speak, uh, uh, particularly, let's say, Shiva, uh, Shiva in Kashmir Shavas. So to wrap it up, um, when we say um, my life or my experience, we always really uh, talking about ourselves. It's not selfish, that's just the way it is. How do you really prove something outside of you? Say, well, it's out there. <clears throat> well, I'm holding this cup, you know, see, it's out there. But holding it itself is an experience. Drinking, you know, warm coffee is an experience. When we interact, it's an experience. Everything is an experience. So something like this, which um, would be yeah. obvious to a child, it's not obvious to grown-ups. We, uh, we grow theories, we grow scientific fields, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the end, um, we get into big trouble because we contradict ourselves. So it's actually um, uh, very funny to watch everything because at the end, you can't help but laugh uh, about us human beings how serious we take ourselves. So we really take ourselves very serious, particularly we scientists, we take ourselves so seriously. Say, well, it's subjective. I mean, this is the way it is. The way it is what? <laughs> uh, our very, our words, the words we use themselves are uh, something we create. So I will stop at that point and we'll come back perhaps to some of these finer points. Thank, thank you, thank you, Menas. So um, now, um, uh, Vinod uh, is both a neurologist and a neurosurgeon, so let's hear his take on uh, the whole question, and perhaps we'll come back to his personal journey, to his understanding. It looks like the next symposium should be on experience. <laughs> what is experience? <clears throat> Think for a moment that we have a symposium on aliveness. We all understand what aliveness is, but it's very hard to define in scientific terms what aliveness is. And same is true of consciousness. To define consciousness is extremely difficult in scientific terms, but we all know what consciousness is. That's our primal feeling that I am, I exist, and I'm conscious, this is my body, this is my world that I'm interacting with. <clears throat> so consciousness in that sense is essentially subjective. It's our primal experience from moment to moment. We not only have fire in the belly, but also fire in the brain. And that fire in the brain is what has been called arousal. Arousal means all the neurotransmitter systems in the reticular formation. I want to minimize the terms in neuroscience, but it's an activating system that's in the brain stem that activates the whole cortex. And unless this subcortical system activates the cortex, cortex cannot function. And this is a very complex process because it involves several neurotransmitters, including norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine. So it's a very complex biophysical system which generates this arousal, which then activates the cerebral cortex. And the brainstem functions extremely fast. 
It's like one action, action potential is like one millisecond, one thousand per second. And the processing time in the brainstem is like one to two milliseconds. And the brainstem also has electrical, electrical synapses. So some of the responses are instantaneous. And the brainstem neurons are connected to each other almost like a syncytium, like a single surface that responds within one thousandth of a, milli, uh, of a second. On the other hand, the cortex is much slower. To make one conscious decision, it takes half a second. That means 500 milliseconds. And to have one percept or experience, so-called experience, it takes one to three seconds. So cortex works much slower than the brainstem. And the brainstem also has what is called the frequency following response. It follows the electrical activity, electromagnetic activity from the environment almost instantaneously. And it has a range of frequency it can follow from 1,000th cycles per second to about 800 cycles per second. Cortex, on the other hand, is limited to about 150 hertz, 150 cycles per second. So there is a sort of instantiation, or almost like a flame that starts in the brainstem and then secondarily calls the cortex. Of course, in Vedanta, this flame, or pilot flame, has been described as Atma Jyotu, Jnana Agni, Atma Prabha. Nanishwar described it beautifully as Atma Prabha Nicha Navi. It's continuously fresh, continuously new. It never gets stale. That's why there is no time, there is no space. It's the flame that is eternal frame, like an eternal spring which is within our brainstem and the reticular activating system. It's an amazing phenomenon. And once you realize how to sense this primal arousal or primal process, then you realize the sense of eternity, the sense of infinity, the sense of going beyond thought and memory and mentation and space and time and all that. So, it's an amazing phenomenon that has been described by our sages. Now the neuropsychologists are coming back to this. If you read the work of Mark Solms, who is a practicing psychoanalyst from South Africa, and his profound statement is, he says, the fundamental stuff of consciousness is not perception. It is arousal. He further says, consciousness is an endogenous property of the brain. It does not stream in through the senses. It doesn't come through the senses. Senses can modulate it. It can influence it. In fact, we are continuously influenced by all the circadian energy, light and sound and gravity and all the molecules. We are at the bottom of an ocean, in a way, of the biosphere. And so these circadian rhythms influence our sleep-wake cycle, our alertness, everything. But the instanta instantaneous activation occurs in the brainstem of the individual organ. Other thing is our consciousness is very personal, very unique. What we know of our conscious experience is a human conscious experience. We can never know what a bat feels like. There is a famous book by Nagel. What, it, what does it feel like to be a bat? And we can never experience that. We can only experience what we are given as instruments of knowledge, instruments of knowing, interacting, and all that. Now, <clears throat> what happens? that we also create the space that we experience. And this space is like three types. One is the personal space, which is a image of our body as we are experiencing from moment to moment. 
Second is the peripersonal space, which is interacting with the reachable space, including your instruments, what your instruments you are using. And we are very good at it. One of the famous statements by Roger Federer was, when I'm playing my best, the racket feels like the palm of my hand. It's part of his body, peripersonal space. And the peripersonal space is mapped on the brain. People can actually know what kind of interactive brain you have that can be mapped on the brain. And finally, there is the extrapersonal space, which is the distant space, the far space, which we process by listening and smelling and also seeing. So these three spaces are there. And then <clears throat> one of the recent research has been this reticular activating system also in interacts with what is called limbic and the paralimbic system. And the limbic and the paralimbic system gives us the feeling, the momentary feeling of this instant, how you feel. And that is the primary process, the primary, whether you are happy, you are sad, you are fearful, you are angry, whatever that is. And this paralimbic system has it's a network. Nowadays, neuroscience people talk about networks. And this paralimbic network has an anterior or the front um, hub called the anterior cingulate gyrus, which acts like a sentinel. It senses what is going on in the environment. Is there a danger or is there an opportunity? And the organism responds to that depending upon whether it's a danger or uh, opportunity. While the posterior hub is called the posterior cingulate cortex and the precuneus network, that has to do with the non-dual awareness or the primary awareness. <clears throat> Zoran Zosipovich, who is one of the neuroscientists from New York, he has written a very good chapter on non-dual awareness, which is Advaita. So Advaita Bhav, and he has given 10 different uh, features of this non-dual awareness, including our sense of being, ineffable emptiness, self-luminous clarity, bliss, infinite wholeness, unity, and continuous presence. And I was glad to read that he gives credit to Buddhism as well as to Advaita Vedanta. Where is is one of the few scientists who acknowledges this great heritage that we have of Advaita Vedanta. <clears throat> now, if you really want to understand consciousness, you need to understand non-consciousness or unconsciousness. And that is fascinating. At least in simplistic terms, there are three different aspects of unconsciousness. One is implicit. Implicit means based on our implicit memories that we have learned something for a long time, learning to ride a bicycle or swimming or speaking in English or Marathi. You don't have to think twice. You don't have to learn it again. It's part of you. Second one is preconscious. Preconscious means it's just at the tip of the tongue. Like if I say two plus two is most of you are thinking of the answer. So that's, that's the pre-conscious aspect. And the third is the dynamic aspect in which we sort of switch between two images. Some of you may have seen the <coughs> image of uh, ambiguous figures, like an old woman versus a young woman. The stimulus remains the same, but you decide whether you want to see the young woman or the old woman and you can switch between the two. That again depends on that. Finally, I just want to mention that we have to come to grips with this unconscious to achieve our well-being. And coming to grips with that, this unconscious, there are different ways. Of course, Freud came with the method of free association. 
you keep talking and talking and talking without any inhibition, and then you get some intimations of the what is going on in your subconscious. Of course, other method is meditation. When you meditate, you naturally go back. It's like reverse engineering, reverse processing. You go back to the very source of your being, the source of awareness, the source of your consciousness. So, and then once you realize the truth of this source of awareness or the source consciousness, source awareness, then you realize that everything is working from inside out. Just like an active volcano or a hurricane, it is from within that activates the whole thing and the whole phenomenon is experienced. One of the interesting statement or shloka that I love is from Hanuman says to Sri Rama that it's about the perspective, what self-perspective we have, what sort of, how do we look at ourselves? He says, Deha bhavena dasosmi, jiva bhavena tvadamsha kaha, atma bhavena tvame vaham itime nishchita matihi. When I look at myself as a, as a physical body, then I'm your servant. When I look at myself as a living, living being, then I'm a minuscule part of you. When I think of myself as the infinite being, the holistic being, the Atman, then I'm you. This is my firm conviction. Another profound statement by King Janaka, he says to Ashtavakra, Akashavad ananto ham ghatavad prakrutam jagat itid jnanam tathaitasya natyago nat layo nagraho laya. I am like the infinite sky, the infinite space. And everything that I experience, the contents of the mind, the contents of consciousness, is like these clay pots or the mud objects. And once you are fully convinced about your own nature as the infinite energy awareness being, then everything is a play in clay. You know, you appreciate that, you realize that, and, but you know what is happening. And finally, I just want to mention a word called holarchy. Holarchy means it's a nested hierarchy of holons. Holons means the whole object or quanta that are embedded like the babushka dolls. And our famous prayer of Purna Madam, Purna Midam, Purna Purna Mudachate, Purnasya Purna Madaya, Purna Meva Vashishate. That is absolutely true. You have these subatomic particles, and there are multiple levels of organizations, one embedded in the other especially in bio, biophysics and bio neurobiology. Cells and organisms or organelles and organ all that, societies. So these are like different embedded systems that work together. So that briefly what I want thank to show. Thank, thank, thank you, Vinod, thank, thank you. So uh, uh, the, uh, the contents of uh, the brain or mind are not necessarily one in one with the uh, information coming in through the stimuli. And uh, our mind consists also of what the contents are. And that brings us to this question that I uh, present to uh, Rudy because the devil is in the details. So how do we avoid neurological decline? Uh, uh, uh. I think we, we may have to get into a question about Alzheimer's oh, okay. All right. first. So to, before that, to follow that. Before yeah. that, yeah. what does yeah. Alzheimer's disease teach us about the yeah. human sense of the self? Yeah, yeah, that's very important. All right. Yeah, because before we talk about yes, yes. how to fix it, we need to know what we're fixing. Right. right? So, um, so, you know, it's interesting. In Alzheimer's disease, what, what is really lost, if you look at the original journals of Dr. Alzheimer, uh, when he met his patient who he described in 1906, August Dieter, who happened to have a early onset familial mutation in uh, one of the genes we discovered in my lab, presenilin gene, 
now, now, we, now that we got a hold of her grain slices in, from the early 1900s. And he wrote in his journal that at night in this Bavarian asylum where her husband had sent her, she was 56 years old, that at night she would uh, yell out loud over and over again, I have lost myself, I have lost myself. And the question is, what is this self that she lost? Well, you know, she didn't lose her soul. She lost her sense of self. She lost ego. She lost her context of herself with the world. And this, you know, when, you, when a baby is born, um, a baby like us has about 100 billion neurons, but the baby has a quadrillion synapses. And right now, everyone in this room has about 10 trillion. So it's kind of like clay. And now you're going to sculpt it down according to your experiences. So with every experience, you're getting rid of synapses, you're making some stronger, you're making some weaker, and you're building your memory map. And we take for granted that we're getting these electrochemical signals in to our brain. They're signals. But then we have to give them context and meaning to turn a signal of what you see or what you hear into information. And the information that you turn that, you turn that signal into information is based on learning, which you already know. So you put things into context, into time and space. So if a baby sees this pen, there's no meaning. Oh, it's a pen. I can write down my thoughts. I can take some notes. It just, you know, it just has a color that they don't even say. There's, there's no meaning. There's just signals coming in. And you learn that as you go through life, you build your map. In Alzheimer's disease, the very network that allows you to take that memory map, and as it's taking in sensations, it's taking in um, feelings, it's taking in thoughts, your brain is bringing you what we call SIFT, sensations, imagination, feelings, and thoughts. And we, we, we categorize them according to our map. We know where to put them, we, we give them meaning. Well, that very information is happening in the limbic system, which, which uh, Vinod mentioned, in, in the hippocampus. A hippocampus means, uh, as you know, seahorse in, in Greek. Um, it looks like a seahorse. And in that area, this is where you have devastation. So these very neurons that, that are able to convert signal into information start to go. Um, and then this starts to spread. And the interesting thing is how it starts to spread. And this is relatively new information. So you might have heard that uh, there's a connectome project. We're learning how different parts of the brain connect to each other in the connectome. And I remember I was at a meeting. Some of you may know Stuart Hameroff, and, and there's a meeting called Toward a Science of Consciousness. Maybe some of you have been to it. And there was a woman presenting new data years ago on the connectome project, and she showed the default mode network. How many of you have heard of the default mode network? All right, so default, default mode network is basically the network by which you maintain ego, for better or for worse, okay? So when you're anxious about the future, because you're not sure it's going to fit that mental map that you've built all your life, when you're obsessing about the past because you're not sure you did exactly what you wanted to do or said exactly what you wanted to say, um, when you're judging others, when you're opining, when you're idling and daydreaming, but you're mainly reinforcing your world that your brain is bringing you, according to your, your memory maps you've built your whole life versus other worlds. You're, you're, you're basically engaging in subject-object split. I'm not one with the world. This is my world. This is how it is. I don't like what I'm gonna have to do next week. I'm not sure about what I did yesterday. That's the default mode network. When, however, you're meditating, when you're in deep sleep after dreaming, um, when you're task-driven, you're focused on a task, um, in all these other cases where you get out of default mode network, this is when you turn down a bunch of neural activity, <clears throat> which is exactly where you make Alzheimer's pathology. So if you track how Alzheimer's pathology spreads, and this is what I had noticed when she showed the default mode network, it's exactly, if you just track it, it's exactly how Alzheimer's pathology tracks and spreads in the brain. So I spoke with Randy Buckner who, at Harvard who who's one of the pioneers of defining the default mode network. And I said, did you notice that in the Connectome Project, the default mode network matches exactly how the Alzheimer's plaques and tangles and inflammation spreads with the brain? He said, yeah, in fact, we have a paper coming out that this is the, this is the path of plaques. And in the amyloid plaques, they travel along the default mode network. And in fact, 
when those neurons fire, in order to get them to stop firing, amyloid, the peptide that makes the plaque, is made deliberately in the synapse. It accumulates and then tells the synapse to stop firing. It actually plays a role, that role on the brain. It stops what's called long-term potentiation, induces long-term depression. David Holtzman's work has shown that during deep sleep, when you're in slow wave deep sleep after REM, it's the only time that a fault mode network is turned off. It's the only time you don't make amyloid in your brain. So this is a real big lesson, and it's relatively new, that says the more we are engaged in ego-driven anxiety, obsession, judgment of others, even the idle mind, you know, there was that old saying, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. Well, every time you are not task-driven, focused, or meditating, or mindful, or present, or in the moment, um, you're making Alzheimer's pathology. It's like we have an expiration date. You know, and I'm not trying to say that anybody with Alzheimer's disease was an egomaniac, not at all, okay, because I have to be careful when I talk about this network. What it means is that we are, we are all, we can't help it. I mean, you talk about the, the fire from the, from the brain stem into the limbic system to the frontal cortex. You know, how we put all that together and maintain who we are and keep context is that default mode network. Well, the fact is, if you use it, you know, it depends on genetics, but if you use it too much, um, that pathology does build up. So this, and we can get into the question later about what you, can you do to stop this. And you know, one of the ways to stop the default mode network is to be more mindful, more present, more contemplative, uh, to meditate, to be more focused, to be more task driven. If you look at monks in a monastery, and you know, I know the monks in the Hindu monastery in Kauai very well, or if you look at Buddhist monks, every bit of the day is task driven and focused. There's no sitting around idling daydreaming or opining, okay? If, you, if, you, if you're not working and task-driven, you're meditating. And this is what the brain needs. And I think we're learning now about the relationship between what we, what we think to be normal, which is the ego, and what pathology comes to all of us as we get older, and maybe we can start to fix it. We can talk about specifics later. Yeah. Th thank you, thank you, Rudy. I think this is a very insightful uh, that uh, the more you are focused on specific tasks, as uh, many people in different walks of life, for whatever reason, their temperament, and we find some of these people are very youthful, even though they might be older in chronological age. So I think this is a great insight. Now, let me turn back to Menas. Uh, what uh, is the connection between quantum mechanics and non-dualism? specifically Shaivism. So they both, uh, they both actually uh, accept um, an undivided wholeness, if I can call it that. The, in quantum physics, in quantum mechanics, what we have um, emerged, I think it was mentioned before in these um, gold standards that we said the Copenhagen interpretation, is um, this division between um, uh, the observer or, and the object, the observer who carries out the measurements and the object. You may say, well, it's a big deal. I mean, <laughs> that's what the entire universe is based on that. So is that the insight of quantum mechanics? What you guys are doing is just um, blobbing the obvious. But actually, uh, in terms of physics, what was always assumed is um, uh, the objective reality, and uh, the physics was totally quiet about the, the experience or the, the subjective aspect. In fact, in, um, in classical physics, there's not even, uh, there's of course a word in everyday life, but in classical physics, there's no term for um, no part in the equations for an observer or the act of observation. So the non-dualism part is really um, very much centered in both of these uh, viewpoints, the quantum mechanics and uh, non-dualism. Um, the wholeness of observation, uh, the observer uh, now just saying that, it doesn't really mean that we know who the observer is. And in fact, this is one of the great mysteries um, 
and uh, a little bit of a funny business that uh, in quantum mechanics, we talk about measurements, but we don't really say who is doing the measuring who, and what is the measurement all about. <coughs> so um, take consciousness. Um, let's say take universal uh, mind. Uh, we have this, um, in English we put, uh, we add words like adjective, like universal, um, because we don't have a word for universal consciousness. So say, well, consciousness, universal consciousness. We say universal mind, and, um, and that's supposed to take care of the issue. Um, but as I said before, um, all these activities are generated by us. It's, it's obvious, and yet it's not obvious. And, you know, this is, again, the, uh, the interesting part about human experience, that what is obvious is um, sort of pushed under the, the rocks, so to speak, under the carpet. And um, then um, we say, well, the problem is solved, as uh, Rudy was saying a little while ago. Um, we tend to ignore some of these obvious things in neuroscience. We build models um, and models and all. And all of these are really uh, activities of the ego, so the big E. The ego, uh, we can demonstrate or we can sort of show by um, inference that it doesn't really exist. So if you permit me a couple of minutes. Um, if it existed, um, let's say it exists forever or it exists momentarily. Well, usually when we think of the ego is, well, you know, it's, we always had it. I mean, it's me, it's, you know, Minas in this case, whatever. But actually there was a time in the past that that name was given to me, okay? It didn't, it didn't exist everywhere. It didn't exist all the time, it didn't exist everywhere, even in my own consciousness. So um, if it didn't exist, before a certain time, uh, it means also it's not going to exist after a certain time. So you may say, well, okay, so what's the big deal? The big deal is that uh, we scientists believe that what we are finding out is eternal. And we take it as a, as a matter of fiat. But actually, it's also an activity, as we said before. It's an activity, it's a conscious activity. And um, if it started, it's going to have an end. So what is common between uh, quantum mechanics and non-dualism, specifically shavism, is, of course, that they had a beginning and they will have an end. Um, and this is the paradox, because in the non-dual world, there's only non-duality. So this dance between existence and non-existence, between um, black and white, between um, up and down, between conscious and unconsciousness. These are the plays of the opposites, and this is what's made up of the universe. Thank, thank you, uh, Menas. Uh, the interplay between being and becoming, right? Yeah. And that's <laughs> what all the thousands of books which have been written on interpretations of quantum mechanics, they cannot solve certain paradoxes because these paradoxes are fundamental to the very fabric of reality. And there is a wonderful uh, dialogue between uh, Yudhishthira and Narada in Bhagavad uh, Puran, where Yudhishthira goes to Narada and tells him, tell me, how do I obtain enlightenment? He says, what you need to do is to study whatever disciplines you are, you meaning anybody, you have to study whatever you're doing, whatever philosophy, whatever work you do, until you reach a point where you hit a paradox. Any uh, rational system, because anything that is expressed in language must be rational. Every rational system, if you probe it at its limits, will have paradox, as Godel showed us uh, mathematically, any form formal system has paradox. And so what Narada tells Yudhishthira is that when you experience that paradox, that's when you have an epiphany, I'm using a 
loaded term here. That's when you have a rebirth. That's when you obtain a deeper experience. That's when you, uh, then you become a new person. And life is all of these passages through many of such births. If you are alive to your environment and really learning what you need to be doing, which is what your actual destiny ought to be. But now, since I had uh, misplaced the question order, <laughs> let's come to the right question, which is, and which of course interests all of us, how do we avoid uh, neurological decline, uh, which I suppose all of us experience to a certain mm -hmm. extent in our lifetimes? Well, I know we only have 10 or 12 minutes left, so right. I'll, be, I'll be brief. Right. Um, I, you know, when we wrote, when Deepak and I wrote The Healing Self, and we had a plan at the back, we were about to do a book tour, and I was trying to think how to encapsulate the advice we were giving in the book. And, um, and luckily, I keep this note in the shower called Aqua Notes. It's a rubber pad. <laughs> the pencil on it says, don't let those good ideas go down the drain. And you know, when you take a shower and you get that water beating on your head, it's almost like a meditation. You can get that into a theta like EEG. And you have all these great ideas, and then all of a sudden you leave the shower and you get the towel and you say, what the heck was I thinking about? So, you know, so get the pad. So I came up with this acronym of SHIELD Your Brain, which now I just did a Senate testimony to the Committee on Aging last month, and they're going to use this for a national agenda because SHIELD, after I tweeted it, and then it was on today's show, it just went crazy. And, uh, and it's an easy way to remember what to do. So sleep, S is sleep. Um, during deep sleep after REM, it's when you really go back to your source. You know, you're turning off the fault mode network, you're turning off the ego, turn off pathology, and it's when the brain cleans itself out. The brain literally has these cells called microglia that eat the debris like amyloid plaque. The brain literally squeezes it out of the brain. Sleep is also when you take all the short-term memories during the day that trigger new uh, you know, memories you have and, and they come up as fictional accounts and dreams. Right after dreaming, you have the deep sleep where you consolidate memory. You take the new memories off the uh, thumb drive, put them on the hard drive. So sleep is number one most important. Um, H is handling stress. And it means really having a meditation practice. And I've done meditation studies. I'm doing a new one right now at the McCann Center and, and uh, with Sarah Lazar. But it's amazing how good meditation is. We, in just a one-week meditation trial that we did with Deepak years ago, we saw that most of the genes involved with inflammation and the genes involved with regulating amyloid in and out of the brain, the plaques, all went in the right direction. It was like beyond what we even expected. So meditation is, is really amazingly good. And chronic stress is a big source of inflammation for the body. So that's H. I is interaction, social engagement. Loneliness is a risk factor for brain um, deterioration and Alzheimer's. Not being alone. If you're alone and you like it, it's great. If you're alone and you don't like it, you're lonely. Twofold increase for Alzheimer's. So it's important to not you know, stay home all the time, to get socially engaged. Um, e is exercise. Exercise helps stop inflammation. It induces the birth of new neurons in the hippocampus, which is affected in Alzheimer's. That's called neurogenesis. So exercise is immensely important. And L, learning new things. Whenever you you know, Alzheimer's disease in the end is loss of synapses, and the more synapses you make every day by learning new things, and the more network and pathways you reinforce, the more synapses you can lose before you lose it. So I tell people, when you're going to retire, don't just think about financial reserve, think about synaptic reserve, right? Just learn, learn new things. And finally, D, diet. The most important thing with diet is plant fiber. Uh, the diet we just had was perfect uh, at, at dinner. Um, because what's most important is you have to keep your gut microbiome. Your three trillion bacteria that live in your gut are keeping your brain healthy. And this isn't just, this is, you know, there's hard science behind us now. In fact, um, uh, uh, Pretty Mukesh Chatter here, we started a company called Marvel Biome where we're exploring the microbiome of the, of, of the gut, how it controls brain um, uh, health. So uh, think more about prebiotics than probiotics. Think about um, in your diet, getting plant fiber, whole grains, and making those three trillion bacteria happy, while you're also getting your probiotics and your yogurt and uh, fermented foods. So, so shield. Thank, thank you, Rudy. Now we have uh, five minutes uh, left. So let me uh, first ask Anand, can you give us an anecdote from your, you know, as, as you've done your career, what is it that drew you uh, into consciousness as uh, a part of your neurological studies? Uh, 
briefly, I, yeah. Yeah, very briefly. I think, honestly, I was never a particularly religious uh, kid when I was in school or in medical school, but I was attracted very strongly to biology and neuroscience. And as I was studying in my residency and in my fellowship here, uh, I started noticing that there were all these strong parallels uh, to stuff mentioned in Indian and Hindu texts. Uh, for a simple example, we just had like uh, the Navratri not too long ago. Uh, people read Durga Saptashati, right? Like, so the, in the Durga Saptashati, there is a section called the Tantrokta Devi Suktam, where like there's about 20 kind of descriptors given to Shakti. Out of that, at least three relate to cognitive processes. It's uh, 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 Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu, Chetana, Chetanetya Bhidiyate, Namastase, 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 Namo Namaha. Chetana is some uh, kind of cognitive process. Same thing, Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu, Buddhi Rupena Samsita, which is intellect. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu, Smriti Rupena Samsita, and then there's uh, sleep, and then there's some emotions. So when you look at these descriptors in our text from the perspective of a neuroscientist, you start to realize, wow, these guys for thousands of years have been giving a lot of attention to cognitive processes. It's not just consciousness, as Dr. Deshmukh was saying, consciousness is a very core aspect of Vedanta, but throughout the Hindu literature and broadly Indian literature as a whole, there is so much focus on neurological processes and cognitive processes. The one difference is this is approached from the inside, so when in an Indian text it's said that this structure exists here, like some chakra is here, that doesn't mean you can do surgery on somebody and you will see it there. What it means, like you close your eyes, you open your third eye, you can sense it there. So it is, that is the crucial difference which I think will need to be bridged when neuroscientists and uh, Indian uh, uh, scholars kind of try to communicate. Thank you. Thank you. One minute each uh, to, to each of you. Um, Vinod, would you want to add to what you already said? Just a minute, no more. Yeah, just, uh, I just want to share two quotations, my favorite from Zen Buddhism. The first one is, to study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. You know, that's a beautiful thing. I go for a walk in the morning, take photographs, write poetry, and share with my friends. So that's one. And the second one Zen saying is, the sacred is in the ordinary. Whatever you think is ordinary is in fact sacred. So there is no difference between the sacred and the ordinary. Beautiful, beautiful sayings both. Thank you. Minas, one minute. Oh, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay, all right, be happy. Uh, as I conclude... Uh, you didn't give me my minute. Oh, you, your minute, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Rudy, a minute. I'll take, take, take 10 seconds. Ten. I agree to be happy. The way to be happy is make other people happy. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, if you want to really turn off your default mode network, um, really thinking about being in the moment and, um, like Manas says, being happy, making others happy, uh, doing, doing new things and enjoying life. Uh, this, is what the, this is what your brain wants. And uh, uh, stay out of all of the, the other deep and dark stuff that the that brainstem tries to drag you into. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, great insight from all of the panelists. And just to conclude, uh, we uh, really stand at a critical moment in uh, humanity's history. Uh, and it's also a moment of uh, deep crisis for science itself. Physics, all of physics theories are based on 0.5% of the observed universe because 95% is dark matter and dark energy and 4.5% is interstellar gas. Uh, there is no place for agency in uh, neuroscience, uh, in, in other fields itself, but then we all have self. So where does it come from? And that's where Atma Vidya, which is Vedic science, uh, has uh, thought very deeply for a long time. I think um, from a perspective of being positive, uh, a positive takeaway from this uh, session, the insights from all of this, in my view, could be helpful in solving some of these fundamental crisis point problems in science itself. And um, we, uh, we, we have this uh, poster that Anand has uh, outside, uh, Neuroscience of Tantra. 20 years ago, I wrote a book called uh, The Gods Within that you can map 
the various devatas into various cognitive centers and so on. There are lots of possibilities, but we need to approach it carefully, rationally, logically, and not get uh, overboard, as sometimes uh, people tend to do. Uh, but I think the possibilities are limitless, and uh, I do hope that uh, all of us here and beyond uh, will take this as a stepping stone. Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you. 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 Thank you.